financial literacy, and the human condition. Welcome to Financial Fitness with the Money Doctor, Dr. Francis Rayum. Okay. Welcome to Financial Fitness. I'm Jess Tyler, along with the Money Doctor, Dr. Francis Rayum. Good morning. Well, hello, Jess. How are you? I love our new setup where we actually get to see each other and talk to each other in the morning rather than just over the phone. Yeah, it's nice. I, I think it is nicer to see people, even if it's on a screen. And and of course, my schedule prevents me from driving to the station all the time and doing the show in person. But this has worked out well for us. And so I wanted to ask you if you have been doing anything on the news about Financial Literacy Month or does anybody talk about Financial Literacy Month? I would mainstream? say that you talk about it. Yes. <laughs> okay, well, all right. So April is Financial Literacy Month. And uh, Beyond Finance commissioned one poll to do a, a study and, and actually got Financial Literacy Week, financial, what was it called? Financial Practice Week uh, okay. added to Chase's schedule of events. Like, like, like anybody pays attention to Chase's schedule of events either. But mm -hmm. so that was just supposed to add a little more value to Financial Literacy Month. And so they had, of course, as you can imagine, a lot of boring uh, statistics but they do translate to how we're really feeling about our money. So how do Gen Zers feel about their money, you know, as opposed to maybe baby boomers? And mm -hmm. what do we know? What, when we say financial literacy, what are we really talking about? So I don't know. I think, you know, financial literacy is so broad. Maybe some people think that means you have to learn how to balance a checkbook or your mm -hmm. bank statement. Nobody uses a checkbook anymore either, but a bank statement. And other people think that means they have to learn how to trade in the market. You know, so for, from my perspective, financial literacy, I think, I don't know, maybe we come up with a new term like, you know, don't be a scaredy cat, right? It's just <laughs> financial literacy is just about sort of warming up to the idea of managing your money and understanding what some of the basic terms mean, but overall, really just understanding like anything else you would want to know, you want to drive a car, you want to have some idea of how it runs. Do you need to be able to, you know, rebuild a transmission? No, but you need to understand, okay, when I get in this vehicle, this, these are my goals. I want to go from point A to point B and I'm going to get there and I'm going to go the long way, the short way, I'm going to do it safely, mm -hmm. whatever the analogy might be, right? So you have to have some framework, some boundary, some basic knowledge. Of I feel like a quiz is coming. Am I getting a quiz? No. Okay. Okay. No, you're not actually. <laughs> and and that's kind of the point. Now you just brought that up. I feel like something scary is going to happen to me if I look at my money. Somebody's mm -hmm. going to quiz me on this. Okay. Your relationship with money is private. It's your relationship with money. If you choose to share that with your partner or with a coach, that's up to you. And that is placing them in a place of honor and trust. So they should be able to uh, speak to you in positive language about this. So if every time, okay, here's another analogy. People say to me, how do you get your cat to ride in the car so calmly? Because she rides everywhere with me, right? She loves okay. it. Okay. Where and, is this uh, analogy going? It's going to the vet. <laughs> how many people can't round up their pet mm -hmm. when it's time to go to the vet? Now, why is that? Why is the dog or the cat in the car, you know, frothing at the mouth, hiding under the seat, clinging to the owner, because the only time they take them anywhere is to the vet. Mm -hmm. And very often that's not always, I mean, most vets are pretty good, but still for not a, a pet, pleasant experience. Yeah. Yeah. For a pet that never goes in the car anywhere, that's not a pleasant experience. So they've associated getting in the car with having a shot or whatever. Now that might seem like a way out there analogy, but let me tell you, it's a lot closer than you think. If every time you look at your money, it's because you're doing it, oh, something awful has just happened. I better sit down and look at my money. Mm -hmm. It's all the bad stuff's already happened to you. And the result is you have to now bother to look at your money and you're probably not going to do it very well, right? You don't feel good about it, all of that. So mm -hmm. just to give you some idea of this, what this lack of confidence in money translates to in the numbers, according to this poll anyway, is that two in five. Only two in five people consider themselves more financially savvy than others. Mm -hmm. That means three out of five people think they know less than their neighbor or their friend or their partner. Three out of five people are going, oh, I'm not very good with money. <laughs> that right? seems accurate. Yeah. 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 39% admit that they procrastinate. 
Mm -hmm. Well, go figure, wouldn't you? I mean, yeah. if, if every time you look at this, you get a bad result, it's going to get worse. Instead, mm -hmm. you need to build some positive things that will help you get over these hurdles. They need to be little, but but you can do it. So we're talking about healthy financial habits. When we mm -hmm. talk about Gen Zers, right? Generation Z is the most likely to procrastinate at about 49%. With baby boomers, no surprise, the least likely to procrastinate at 22%. Mm -hmm. Now, you can come up with all kinds of social uh, parameters as to why this happens. I'm going to say baby boomers have had more practice at it. Mm -hmm. Good, bad, or otherwise, they've had more practice at it. They've had more time to hone their skills. They've learned how to do the kinds of things we can talk about so that you're they're not quite so afraid and they don't procrastinate quite so much. I don't think it's that they're, you know, just better uh, doers. It's not like they all grew up on the Nike do it now thing, right? It's just <laughs> everybody, everybody procrastinates when it's something you don't want to do. So yeah. let's, let's talk about that one little thing for just a minute. How do you get around procrastinating? Now I have a little sign on my desk. I can't reach it from here, but it says the top 10 reasons I procrastinate one period. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yes. And I've used it over the years as sort of a gauge of how tightly somebody is wrapped when they're in my office about their finances. In other words, if they look at it, because they usually do, they'll like, you know, glance over at that sign and they're talking to me and they look at the sign, they talk and they look at the sign. If they start to laugh right away, then I know, okay, this is this is easy. These people are have a sense of humor about their money. They're going to be mm -hmm. okay. But most of the time people will look at it and they won't laugh until about halfway through the meeting or at the end of the meeting. And I know that that's because they, they're just not proce processing it. They're having a quiz. Top 10 mm -hmm. reasons I procrastinate. What's she going to ask me? What's number two? I don't know. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay. Yeah. For me with the quiz, I was thinking like your the terms, because I will say since we started doing the show together, when we first started, like I didn't really know the difference between an annuity and a CD. So there, there are so many terms with oh, yeah. finances. That, so that's what I was thinking along the lines of uh, a literacy quiz. Yeah. It's, it's financial jargon. Um, this, this stat actually surprised me. 40% of Americans have no idea what a 401k is. Now, I, that's a pretty vague comment that that's how it was listed in the article. I think, you know, they probably don't know how it works. They've heard of them. They've heard of them. They may not have one. 40%. I would have thought, okay, everybody knows what a 401k is. Right. But I'll, I'll tell you, there are so many plans. You can have a 401k, a 457, a 403b, a 401a. You can have a self-directed IRA. I mean, the list goes on and on, a solo 401k, whatever. You can have all kinds of plans that sound like they work like a 401k, but they all have their own little rules. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what do I always tell you? I always tell you how to fix it, right? So these are all the things we're afraid of, cause us to procrastinate, feel like we're not as good at money as somebody else that we know, hide it from our partner, uh, whatever. I, I think there was something like, uh, I'll, I'll give you the stat when we come back, but something like more than half of the people said that uh, finances have a negative effect on their relationship. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's it, it works its way into there too. So one of the things you can do is don't pick the thing you're the most frightened of, right? Don't, Let's not whack it with a club. Let's just poke it a little with a stick, okay? Pick something yeah. that's a little scary, like, oh, I don't know. I don't open my mail, all right? Now, for some right. people, I don't open my mail is the scariest thing. And for others, it's just like, you know, I could probably get better at that. I could probably mm -hmm. fix that. And so I'll take that one item. Here's what you do. If you're afraid to go to the mailbox and open your mail, maybe you don't do it every day. Maybe you do it every couple of days, right? But mm -hmm. come up with a plan that is comfortable for you. And then here's my rule, touch it once. Don't open it up, put it to the side, decide you'll look at it later, push it around your desk, come back a week <laughs> later, because you know what's gonna happen? That thing you were afraid of will happen. Mm -hmm. The fact that you were afraid that you were going to have a late fee or a delinquency notice, the longer you wait, the more likely that is to happen. So it, this is like ripping off the Band-Aid, okay? Mm -hmm. If you're afraid to get your mail, Decide, I'm going to get it three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Saturday, whatever. Mm -hmm. Do that and ha and do it at a time when you can say, okay, I'm going to get the mail. Maybe you have to put a little special thing on your desk to remind you or whatever, or some 
treat yourself to some happy thing. I'm going to get the mail after I have my coffee and biscotti, whatever it is, uh, coffee and Cheerios, I don't care. But um, decide you're going to get the mail and then bring it in, sit in a place that feels good to you. Don't make it so miserable. Don't, you know, mm -hmm. we do these awful things to ourselves, Jess, not just about finance, about everything. You know, you're going to go. Yeah, to the end. anticipation and the dread kind of builds up. And that's worse than probably the actual thing. It, it is. And so, you know, just and take this in small bites. Say to yourself, I'm going to try this for two weeks mm -hmm. and see how it goes. I'm just going to promise myself I'm going to do this small thing for two weeks and see how it goes. And if I'm doing well, if it feels good and that improved it, then I'm going to pick the next thing. And we can talk yeah. about what some of the next things are. But don't start off by saying, I have to figure out my retirement. <laughs> if you've That's never kind of a big, that, uh, big bite to chomp off. Yeah, do it in little bits so that you work up your... It's the same thing as, so I'm a vocalist, right? And people mm -hmm. will always say to me, well, you don't look nervous on stage. Yeah, I don't. First of all, you know, I started off doing it when I was nervous, but I would mm -hmm. kind of fake my way through it. And, and I knew I was nervous, but maybe other people didn't. But the mm -hmm. only way to get by that is to do it over and over and over again. And believe me, it's painful for a while, but then yeah. it starts to get to be fun actually mm -hmm. fun. If you can imagine going to your mailbox, getting your mail and actually not being miserable about, miserable about it, actually having fun, then believe it or not, you can get there. You can. Yeah. Because if you're going and you're expecting a late fee, I don't think that's ever going to be fun. But I guess if you do it often enough, get on top of it, you won't have late fees. Well, that's true. And you know what? You might have a late fee, but what's going to change if you don't get your mail? Is it going to get better mm -hmm. on its own? Who's going to do think those just dishes? You know? Yeah, I think you just push it out of your mind. Like, I don't have to deal with it today, but I'll handle it tomorrow. And then yeah. tomorrow and tomorrow, it gets really easy to put it off. And usually what happens is when people are doing that, they're rewarding themselves in other ways to make themselves feel better. So they say, mm -hmm. I know that mailbox is ugly. I don't want to go there. I'll deal with it tomorrow. Today, I'm going to go get a latte, you know, <laughs> and, and it just makes things worse. So I yeah. know you don't want to do it. I mean, nobody wants to, you know, go to the dentist or... What, nobody wants to do these things, but mm -hmm. leaving them undone is worse. And I promise you, if you will just do some of these small things a little bit at a time and just give yourself a gut check, I don't care if you keep a diary. Okay, day one, it was really hard to go to the mailbox. Mm -hmm. Day two, it was hard, but I did it. Day three, maybe I procrastinated. I didn't do it at all. Shame on me. I'll get back on it the next day. And the next day you get it and you say, I actually did this. I went to the mailbox. I opened it up. Yeah, the news wasn't great, but at least I knew it. The yeah. fear of the unknown is much worse than whatever's in your mailbox. And if you have something really scary in your mailbox, call us and we'll help you with it. Even if, even if it's not scary, we'll help you with it, right? But the fear of the unknown is always worse than the All actual right. act of doing it. We're going to talk more about this coming up, but I do want to get your phone number. Sure. You can reach us at 413 773-3333. Or you can go to hugyourmoney.com. We'll be back with part two of financial fitness with the money doctor, Dr. Francis Ram, right here on WHMP. Welcome back to financial fitness. I'm Jess Tyler, along with the money doctor, Dr. Francis Ram. Hi. Hi. I promised you a stat when we came back about relationships. Okay. So let's hear. 39% admit that finances have a negative uh, effect on their relationship. Mm -hmm. And 63% agreed that learning it together could vastly improve their relationship, learning about yeah. finances together. That makes yeah. sense because I don't think anybody comes into a relationship with perfectly aligned thoughts on money. It's, there's always a little bit, um, you know, there's the people that are like, one's a spender, one's a saver. That's horrible. But even the ones that are on the same wavelength, I'm sure there's a few things they disagree on. Oh, you think? <laughs> <laughs> you deal wow. with this every day. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, just when I think I've heard every story, I, I get another one, but sometimes people will call me and, and I always say, I, I want to see both people together uh, mm -hmm. unless there's some extenuating circumstance. Right. And sometimes people will kind of hedge around it. Like, well, you know, my husband works a lot or my wife is, it's really hard for her to come to an appointment. And eventually they might tell me why. And it mm -hmm. could be anything from, look, we're really fighting about it and that's unpleasant. And I, I just have to get my head together before I can do this as a couple to right. um, I think I'm leaving my spouse and I need to know how my finances will play out. 
what what can I learn? You know, because I'm afraid I won't be able to land on my feet uh, mm -hmm. or my spouse is leaving me. Or even, uh, geez, I racked up a bunch of credit card debt and I never told my partner. And now, Ooh, yeah. Really do. Yeah. So you hear things like that. But other times it's just things like, well, I really want to retire and I think I have enough money to do it, but my wife wants me to keep working or my husband wants me to keep working. Or mm -hmm. my partner says, I'm going to retire and die. And I don't want to have that conversation. I just <laughs> want to retire, you know? And there are lots of reasons why it's difficult for couples to discuss this stuff. But I will tell you that it gets much easier when you involve an objective third-party financial coach. Mm -hmm. um, I I will give you tough love if I think you need it, but I use it pretty sparingly, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, I've had couples where, you know, one of them is verbally abusive to the other in front of me in the meeting. Ugh. And I've had- That's say, awkward. Okay, I'm sorry, but you can't do that here. Yeah. You know, this is, this is my turf, my rules, you know- I think what you mean to say is, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, or a better way to say that might be, or let me paraphrase if I understand what's going on here. And, and so you can iron it out, but a lot of times people are really pretty abusive, even subtly verbally abusive, like, and, and to themselves, mm -hmm. I can't tell you the number of times I've had to say to people, okay, let's change your conversation you're having with yourself about money because I'm saying, well, let's do this. Oh, I'm really bad at that. And mm -hmm. I have to say, no, you used to be really bad at that, but now you're trying to change. Now yeah. you're trying to get better at it. So now you say to yourself, wow, okay, what does a new self do with money? What, how do I, the new self says, I sit down and I work on this thing, right? The old yeah. self says, I'm really bad at that and I ignore it. And people mm -hmm. pick that up. They really do. Um, 35%, going back to my stats here, don't know what interest is in a financial context. I'm mm -hmm. astonished that people answered that way, but they did. Uh, 30% didn't think they could win a game of financial trivia. I was, I thought okay. that was low. I think a lot more people than that would say, I'm not winning a game of financial trivia, depending on how, 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 how hard it was. Yeah. Yeah. So there's this overall lack of confidence. So the top reasons for procrastinating, 25% said all together now, stress. <laughs> right. Mm. And 16% said, I don't look at it because I don't think it can get any worse. So who cares? Mm -hmm. Right. And then 13% just say, I don't know. I just, I forget to do it. It's just forget. Yeah. Um, that's not a hundred percent. So we don't know what the rest of them say so for, for, um, for they couldn't bother to fill out the list. That's, that's what happened. Yeah, maybe yeah. they could <laughs> They procrastinated too much. <laughs> They're still working on it. It'll get done some, someday. <laughs> the deadline came and went, but they didn't even see it. I love it. Oh boy. Let's see. Um, oh, the average American checks their banking app twice a day. Mm -hmm. Yet 50% say they're nervous when they open their banking app. You mm -hmm. talk about a slow torture. L let me get this straight. You're really nervous when you open your banking app, but you're doing it twice a day mm -hmm. and you won't go get your mail. Yeah. Pick the less scary thing and do that, okay? Right. If, if the less scary thing is to start a jar and throw coins into it, start there. Mm -hmm. But pick something you have a little fear of. Don't say, well, okay, like like for, for um, uh, New Year's resolutions, I said I was going to gain weight and stop, smoke and stop smoking. <laughs> Things you well, wanted to do. <laughs> I, I never smoked, so that was really easy to me. And gaining weight was probably an inevitable. So I said, those are the two things I'll do for New Year's resolutions. Yeah. Okay, so be be tougher on yourself than I was. Um, yeah, Generation Z, most uncomfortable at opening their banking app, 65%. Mm -hmm. And baby boomers, 26%. Yet they're opening it twice a day on average. What that tells me is they're really worried about their balances or what's mm -hmm. going on with their banking app, right? Um, and it also tells me the banking industry has been able to gamify your money a bit in a way that's causing people to look at it all the time. Right. Uh, when it comes to budgeting, that terrible word, that awful word that nobody wants to do, which is why we don't ask people to build a budget. We ask them to track their expenses and then we mm -hmm. help with the budget, right? Because a budget shouldn't be this little box that you have to live in. It should be a flexible, fluid thing. But when it comes to budgeting, here's my point, 81%, uh, both baby boomers and millennials try mm -hmm. to make a budget. They try to, to limit themselves on their spending. 81% give it their best yeah. shot. 34% fail at it. 
-hmm. only 66% stick to it on average. So um, baby boomers stick about 76% of the time with generation Zers at about 42%. So, yeah, I wonder how much it is of whether they stick to it or whether, as we've talked about on a bunch of shows, prices are so high now that what you're bringing in isn't covering your expenses. And that's why you're not sticking to it. Not, you know, from going out and spending a bunch of money on other things. Well, that is actually the point of having a budget that is flexible. Mm -hmm. Because when prices go up, rather than saying, oh my gosh, I can't stick to my budget, which was a rigid number I put down the bottom line when I I got it done once and for all, I checked the box, right? Rather than doing that, as the prices are going up, if you're tracking your expenses, you start to see it and you say, oh, geez, I had a hundred dollar deficit this month. Prices are going up. Where am I going to make up for that? Instead of landing someplace where you say, well, I have $5,000 on a credit card because prices went up and I couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. You know, whenever I, I don't really care what went on somebody's credit card. You know, when they come to see me or or we have a Zoom meeting, they always think I'm going to be really judgmental. And they Mm -hmm. try to tell me right away, well, I only have this credit card because I was going just fine. And then, you know, there's always this long explanation. And I sort of cut them off like, okay, unless it's from an obsessive shopping disorder, compulsive shopping disorder, or unless it's from something that's going to continue that we Mm -hmm. can't fix together. Gambling debt or something like that. Then I just call it, so what? That's just, Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, of course you have this stuff. You know, well, I think that is a fear though, like what? you were saying it's with any professional, like when you go into a dentist, you don't want to tell them how much you're going to flow. You feel like you're going to get lectured. And I think that that's the fear going in, but that's not what you're going to give them. No, there's no point. Yeah. Um, it's not fruitful and it certainly doesn't feel good and it mm-hmm. won't get the result we're looking for, which is for people to warm up to the idea of, Hey, I can do this. This mm-hmm. isn't it. You know what the real shame is. I, I remember in the fourth grade, we had a, a teacher that taught us how to write a check. And I remember going home and telling my mother, the teacher taught us how to write a check today. Mm-hmm. And they thought that was the strangest thing, you know, like in the fourth grade, they taught you how to write a check. Yeah. yeah, Because it was a math teacher. And so she used that as a way to teach us how to balance a check statement, a checking account. Mm-hmm. Now yeah. in the fourth grade, in the fourth grade, we could balance a checking account. Because Mm -hmm. it's addition and subtraction. It wasn't that hard, right? Yeah. So that became not a scary thing to me in my life. But we Mm -hmm. don't give kids this any longer. We don't give adults this. I'm curious with literacy, it's literacy month for April, you said, right? Do they do anything in the schools with that? Do you know? Some schools do. Some schools uh, really will will do that. But I think it's a little too little too late. Um, Mm -hmm. Better than never. But yeah. so, so there's a great example of how technology can help us a lot and it can also hinder us. So a lot of people don't have to balance a checkbook anymore because yep. they get an e-statement, they import it into QuickBooks and QuickBooks, they go click, 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 click. Oh, look, I'm off somewhere. Oh, I'll just make an adjustment and move on. Mm-hmm. Or, yeah. or they go find it, but they don't really have to understand why it's happening. Whereas, Mm -hmm. you know, when you used to do it on ledger sheets and things like that, it was very helpful. So I I think um, we are missing some basic things. You know, when it comes to saving money, for instance, you know, how do we teach kids how to save? And there's a whole chapter of this about this in the book about having them split it into four pieces so that they can get replaced later on with things like taxes, right? And Mm -hmm. so so you can uh, learn about that. But so in this uh, survey, 53% save money by buying on sale items. Now, mm-hmm. This reminds me of the, of the uh, comedian who said, my wife saves me money buying stuff. Honey, look at these great towels I bought that we didn't need. I saved $50 buying them, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I, I love that. 53% save money by buying on sale items. Now I understand what they mean, but still that can get out of hand. 47% mm-hmm. by using coupons or discount codes, 45% by limiting spending on clothing, 42% by shopping at discount stores. Mm -hmm. Then people got serious about it and said, many people get more drastic and they say they limit their social outings to bars and restaurants at 39%. And at 36%, they limit travel or they don't travel at all. Mm -hmm. These are areas that people expect me to tell them when we're working on things, you can't do that. I don't want you to take a vacation. It, it, I just can't say it enough. It isn't useful. It isn't going to work. If I tell you not to take a vacation, first of all, 
you won't do any of the things I'm asking you to do because you'll take the vacation instead. And secondly, I haven't really helped you manage Mm -hmm. your finance. Managing money means finding a way to have enough money to make those payments, whether it's the monthly payments that come in or whether it's the um, the overcharge uh, fees that you're getting on your checking account, being able to mm-hmm. correct that so you don't get them in the future, buying a car, taking a vacation. These are all real life things. And every time I ask somebody to do a budget, they often will come back and say, well, you know, we did the month, but it wasn't real life because we took a vacation. It wasn't real life because it was the holidays. Mm-hmm. You're never going to have a holiday or take a vacation again. That is yeah. real. We just need to divide the expense by 12 or six or three or however often you take those, have those expenses. So, mm-hmm. you know, the, the closing thoughts on this really is we can do this together. You can do it alone if you want to, but it's harder. Um, yeah. But it's just a matter of taking a step at a time. And just the first step is to decide you're going to get a little education. You don't have to go sign up for a course in macroeconomics, right? You just have to say, I need to learn how other people have done this. What mm-hmm. what works for them? Because the person with a lot of money telling you how to manage your money when you have none, mm-hmm. it's, it's not, not going to happen. No, I will say too, if you're, I will say too, if you're with a couple too, and I see this happen all the time, and I'm sure you see it where you can be telling your spouse one thing and they're not hearing you, but if they go to a separate person like you, you could say the same exact thing and they're going to hear it. Yeah, it's true. Um, It may be that I say it in a different way. It may be that I have the the credentials and the trust Mm -hmm. to get that point across, but also I tend not to muddy the waters with a lot of other stuff. You know, Mm -hmm. I, I get right to the heart of it. You can tell me a 10 minute story about how things are going in your relationship and I'm going to pull out the parts that I think have to do with money. And mm-hmm. then I'm going to say, what if we implemented this and or implemented that? And you can make some choices. You can try it on for a while and see if it likes you, see if you like it. And if it doesn't, then we make another another plan. But mm-hmm. that's that's the point of working with a coach. It isn't um, you're not you're not patching a tire, right? You're You're wanting to get something that you can use that is flexible, that grows Mm -hmm. with you. And the more you work it, the more it works for you. And that's Mm -hmm. why, you know, we handle the debt, the budget, the retirement planning, all in one place so that you don't have to feel overwhelmed by it. We just take it a step at a time, depending on what, where your starting point is. And then Mm -hmm. we go from there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, how can people get a hold of you? Well, they can reach us at 413-773-3333. Or visit us on the web, of course, at HugYourMoney.com. And you promised me more questions. Do we have a question show coming up? Do we have questions? Yes. Maybe we'll do it next week. Yeah, I love the question shows because as we say, you know none of the questions ahead of time. So you just kind of get them thrown at you. I do. It's maybe not It's not um, a financial uh, trivia test, but it's close. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I always love that. And people write really interesting questions, sometimes very yeah. complex, sometimes simple. But I think when someone takes the time to email you and write in with a question, it certainly deserves an answer. And if we answer it on the air, of course, they get a, a copy of my book, Retire Debt and Retire Well. And uh, and that will tell you a lot of how we work here as well. Yeah. All right. That is awesome. So look forward to that next Saturday right here on Financial Fitness with the Money Doctor, Dr. Francis Ram on WHMP. 